He knows that we can't change the world Drinking coffee in our socks But I'll ask you to ponder Encourage you to wander And buy you a drink on the rocks Welcome to Inspired Path. I'm excited. We have Molly Miller here today. Thank you for having me, Andy. Well, it's great that you were able to take the time out on your Thanksgiving break, flying back from, was it Massachusetts? Massachusetts, yeah. That's and, right. And what were you doing there? Um, I was working on a, a movie out in Massachusetts, a, a scary movie. You know what? That reminds me of, of when we first met. I think when I... I met you, I came to Emily's graduation and you had been in a couple of movies or something and you were showing me the clips and they were scary movies. Oh yeah, you know what? Um, Scary movies are kind of my thing, (laughs) my wheelhouse, (laughs) you could say, because um, I don't know, people find uh, kids creepy, I guess. (laughs) 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 Or like small. (laughs) <laughs> like, you know, look at the Shining Twins, look at the, um, um, what other creepy kids are in movies, just uh, be, because I'm small and I stunt double kids, um, I tend to do a lot of scary movies. Well, that's awesome. So, so did you, I guess that's what, you know, part of why we're here today is to talk about, you know, inspiring stories and yours has just been, to me, a phenomenal journey, you know, talking to you and then watching a lot of it grow on social media. You know, how did you get into being a stunt woman? So I started, uh, I first started as an actor. Um, I took acting classes here in Ohio at the Hood School of Acting. And then um, I really fell in love with with working in, working in film. We also, uh, Ohio uh, brought in a lot of film productions when they offered a tax incentive. Um, and back in 2009, a lot of film productions would film, uh, well, would film in Cleveland. Uh, the Avengers filmed here, and they sh- they shut down like some major highways in east or east or west Cleveland. I forget exactly where for like two weeks, and they filmed some big scenes for the Avengers movie, and they did Captain America. So anytime there was like a big movie in town, um, I would sign up with the local casting company. Um, to be an extra. So I started doing extra extra work in movies and making these connections with people in the industry and um, while taking acting classes and pursuing um, pursuing a career on the side and and uh, yeah, I also met a stunt coordinator, a local stunt coordinator in Ohio named uh, Rick Fike. He, he has his own um, martial arts dojo out in Madison, Ohio. And he invited me to personally train with him because he saw potential for me to be doubling kids. He, he looked at me on set one day and he's like, you are like the perfect size to double a kid. You're, you're an adult, you're little, like I need you on my team. So he, he offered to um, train me. Wow, that's awesome. And so I, I trained with him for like five, five years five or six years and um, got my first stunt job on a film here in Ohio. And and then one thing led to another. I kept making more connections and I was able to build a career out of it. So what when you say five years of training, like what kind of training was that? Oh, Can so you give we, some examples? Um, yeah, so uh, I remember my first day. We were, um, it was in the summer. Uh, we pulled out a big ladder and he had these big port porta pit mats, um, these huge squishy mats that you can fall on. And it, we went behind his dojo and put up like this 12 foot ladder and we were jumping off of them and, and doing high falls. So we were practicing how to fall uh, like the right way and land land safely in a way that we won't hurt ourselves. Wow. So there's, there's a couple different type of falls that people do. There's headers where you go head first. Um, and you almost like flip over. And then there's the, the suicide fall, which is where you just go, you lean backwards and you uh, fall laying back, just flat on your back. Wow. And, uh, yeah, so we, we, did, um, we did high fall training. Um, we did mixed martial arts. So we did some fight scene training. 
Uh, we learned how to do stair falls. Um, so what is it like falling down the stairs? Does it take a lot of practice? Oh, it, it does take a lot of practice. We we pad up, so we wear a lot of pads and stuff, and we do things as safely as possible. That's um, the number one uh, priority in the stunt business is to to do things as safely as you can without getting hurt. Um, and uh, yeah, falling down the stairs was actually kind of fun. I enjoyed it. It was it was bumpy. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> <laughs> and is it I just mean, like someone pushed you down the stairs or is it a tumble down the stairs what yeah it was like a, a tumble down the stairs so y- nobody pushed you i mean they do end up doing that in certain scenes but when we were first training in it um we crawled down the top stairs ourselves and then started to roll down the stairs wow and then just to get a feel for it and then um and then we would go like harder, learn or do like flip over down the stairs, and uh, we would have pads down down at the bottom of the stairs, and we'd be wearing you know uh, elbow pads, knee pads, um, all this squ- squishy padding. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was fun, yeah. I liked it. Do you have a favorite did, during training? Did you have a favorite stunt that you like to practice? Did you have something that? Um, I do like I, wire work is my f- favorite. Being in a harness and on a wire, and getting yanked backwards. Um, that that that's my favorite. I, I like to go flying. <laughs> cool. Now is that yeah? So can you give an example like when that's used? You know when you're being pulled backwards. Yeah. So I, I the one of the really good examples I can use is um, if you think of like a Marvel film when there's a big explosion scene like if there's a bunch of cars blowing up in the background and there's people running and uh and and something something blows up and the, you just see them shoot back Those. shoot backwards and or fly out of frame or flip flip over that's usually done in a harness on a wire wow that has to be thrilling because you're right the scene's happening and then all of a sudden you know that moment comes and you're just yeah you just go flying. You just go flying in a direction you can't see. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's, it's very thrilling. So after so after you got through the five years of training, like what actually, what got you from Olmstead Falls, Ohio to California? Oh, so um, I had worked on a another scary movie. It was a dark comedy called Little Evil. And that was filmed here in Ohio. And I had met the assistant director on that who was from Los Angeles. And um, he told me, you know, I would do really well if I moved to LA. And he offered to uh, connect me with people out there if I ended up moving out there. And he actually really uh, encouraged me uh, to go out there. And to be perfectly honest, I was terrified to make that move from Ohio to California because I didn't really know anybody out there. Um, and that's it's my, all my family's here in Ohio. He planted the seed to move to LA. So I worked on a movie with some LA connections. And, and then it, he wasn't the only one that told me that. Um, there was another person that mentioned that I would work all the time. And really, uh, I really enjoyed working in the industry here, but it wasn't uh, a year-round job for me, no. and I I knew, like I would only work on one or two jobs a year. And, and Cleveland, Ohio, right now is right. not known for it. It's not known. <laughs> not known for the film industry. It's, it's, <laughs> right, it's growing. It's definitely growing, and we're getting more productions. But it's not a place that I can work full time doing stunt work. And I knew I had to um, either move to LA or Atlanta, some some bigger market. Can you think back to like what were, you know, you said obviously it was scary, but I mean, what can you remember like some of the things that I know it's been a few years now that were going through your mind? Like you said he really encouraged you and someone else planted the seed to, you know, what was like going through your mind prior to going out there? I loved stunt work. I loved working on movies and I knew, um, I knew I had to take a leap of faith to to make a full time career out of it, and uh, for for me, uh, 
I, I could have played it safe and stayed stayed home and just, you know, worked once or twice a year here. Or I could have made a career, out, like I could make a career out of it and work all the time. And I knew my, I knew my choices were stay home, play it safe, or go out there and see what I can do. And uh, the motivation for me was I didn't want to live with the regret of not trying to see where I could go and and what I could do. Um, so the fear of having all these what ifs, like what if I what if I went out and did this? What what if I um, what if I had done something different? Like I didn't want I didn't want to live with that. I I think that's what motivated me to actually get myself out there because I knew I could always come back home. I, and I knew I had to try. It, it was either, it, it, it was either go out there and try it, or always live wondering if I could have made it. And you're right. I mean, mm -hmm. some people do that their entire life. Yeah. They they stay in a nine to five job, or they stay in something they're not happy with, and just aren't willing to take. And that's a great example using the word leap of faith. Yeah especially coming from, you know, Olmstead Falls is a pretty small town. I mean, it's obviously a lot bigger now than it was, you know, 10 years ago. Yeah. But going to basically the big city. Yep, it was a, it was a huge leap of faith. Um, and it was scary, but I was willing to take that risk. You know, it's, it's, it's fine if some people are, are comfortable with being comfortable. Like, I know everybody's different, but for me, I, it, I had that internal, what do you call it? That internal struggle a little bit. And, and I, was, I was more and more motivated to try. It, it's hard to describe, but, no, but I, I, I had not. that internal push. Absolutely, and I'm sure that's what actually got you there. Yeah. So once you got out there, I mean, what did you find coming from Midwest to, you know, LA? I mean, what did you find when you got out there? What was, what were the living arrangements like? What oh. were that? Because you said you went out there knowing no one. Right. I didn't know anybody out there. Um, so I found uh, there. So my my dad helped me find this um, living situation. There was an artist community, which which was really cool. It was for artists like of all types writers musicians dancers actors um, it's it's a house a shared housing arrangement like they had bunk beds in a couple different rooms and um it, it was cheap and an affordable way to live in la and the community was called upstart and uh i didn't i didn't know the people but i interviewed or like i've FaceTimed with the person that owned that property and she told me about it and that, you know, everyone is background checked and vetted and the community is, is really cool. Like people would collaborate together and, and work on projects together, which I thought was, I thought was neat. It sounded like a, almost like a college type <laughs> scenario. Like living and in so, a dorm or like living in a dorm or fraternity. <laughs> yeah, but with with creatives and with creative people, and uh, uh, it sounded like a good opportunity and, and just a fun thing to try. So I um uh, I submitted an application and they accepted it, and uh, I lived there for four months, and, and it was pretty fun. It, I met from people from all over the world. There was um a dancer from Brazil, um, there was a musician from uh, uh, New Zealand, uh, people from all over. So so that was fun. And it sounds like a very supportive community. It, it was really, it was a really good community to live in, to start off with and living in LA and it was affordable. So Now did jobs come right away or was it a situation where it took a while to get a project going? It took about four months for me to book a long-term job. I was working uh, as an, a stand-in and extra on set out in LA. So I would go to different productions and um, that, that, paid, that, that paid my rent, which was good. But it, yeah, it took four months for me to land a big job. And once I landed that job I, that I worked on for like a year, um, I, I was good. I was good and then I was able to like uh, 
move out and move into a different place with like with two roommates and instead of instead of like (laughs) 15 (laughs) 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 but I'm kind of as much as a fun experience that was I'm kind of glad I could move out because it was um it was a little crazy and chaotic. <laughs> yeah, you probably didn't have much quiet time no with, quiet. With, with 15 people in the same building. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> with close quarters. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it sounds like not only there, but, you know, you talked about, you know, the importance of, the, it sounds like your family, you know, I mean, I know your mom and dad and, yeah. and sister, and but it sounds like, you know, I mean, that's a key, was a key for you too, that you have a supportive family. I do. And I'm, I'm very, very fortunate. And I realize that I'm very lucky to have that support system because um, I, I was able to feel safe enough to make that leap knowing that I could come back. And that's yeah. huge because it's not like, hey, you got a job down in, you know, mm-hmm. corporate Cleveland, Ohio. You know, this is right. like, hey, my daughter's going to move across the country. Right. I mean, so that's more of like you following your dreams. Exactly. And your parents were... My parents were very supportive and and let me do my own thing. And they, they, want, they wanted me to be happy. They wanted to see me doing something that I loved. And, and, and they want that for all of us. And so they support us in every way they can to, to make that happen. And uh, I, I definitely wouldn't be there where I am today without them. Obviously, the mo- even people watching this don't fully understand like all the production that goes into it behind the scenes. Right. So, you know, they may look at this like, oh, she stands in and, you know, does this job and yeah. it, it all it all looks easy when it comes out in the finished product. But but you know what what is a typical day like if you had to pick a set that you were on or something and you know obviously if there's one you can talk about or something like that i mean what what's a typical day for you look like so i can give you an example of uh as a stunt performer what a typical day looks like for us or from start to finish on a project so there's a lot of prep prep work involved before you even shoot the movie um so uh, the, the, they hire a stunt coordinator and a stunt team, and they bring on a core team of people to design the action. And the, you, you have to read through the entire script and look it throughout the script and see where um, which, which of the scenes in it um, involve any bit of action, where it's maybe a kid falling off his bike or there's a, a fight breaks out in a schoolyard or, you know, different things. And then we have to design that action. So the stunt coordinator and his team will go through and, and for each specific scene, they'll come up with a, like a fight sequence or a, a way to fall to, to make it look uh, realistic. And, um, and then uh, we give a, we come up with a couple different ways to do it so that we can give the director some options. Like maybe he doesn't right. like a certain, maybe he didn't want the kid to fall off the bike to the left, but to the right instead. Okay. Or maybe he wants a different angle when he's shooting the scene. And sometimes, or maybe the kid hits a rock and he flips over the bike head first. So... There's all these different ways you can fall off a bike, you know? Wow. Um, so we'll go through the action and, and design that. And then they'll, um, then you have, then you have the prep work leading up to that. Then we film it so we can show it to the director. And, and then there's rigging. There's a rigging team that actually sets up the, the stunt and, in a way that we can film it safely. So sometimes may, maybe the bike is hooked on a wire and to, to lift it up higher. Like if you can't like, if say this bike is going, you're gonna hit a rock and right. the bike is gonna get some good air. Um, so sometimes that can be challenging to do like consistently and right. multiple times. So they'll do like, a, um, they'll rig the bike up so that 
um, there's a wire system that pulls it up higher. Oh, okay. And then, and then um, you can flip over the bike head first. And then, it, well, there's all these different different ways, but then you have the equipment that you need to set up a gag like that. So you have like, um, you have the all the wire stuff. Uh, I, I'm not really good with all the technical pieces of the the, the rigging stuff on set, but there's no, a lot. No, but that lot. still gives some background of what what goes into it that you just don't walk in read the script and you're doing that stunt right there's a team of people that physically set up that stunt so that you're able to perform it the right way and and in a safe manner um and so that takes a lot of prep on the day too so so we rehearse the stunt and then we then we shoot it on a different day once you get approval from the director and this okay. is and this is just one small snippet of of a stunt gag. There's there's a lot of stunts in, in movies. So, wow. And then what about obviously whoever whoever's the the actor that's playing that you have to be made up to look to be, to be made up to look just like the actor. Yeah. So then um, the stunt the stunt double we go through we get to set really early in the mornings and we go through hair and makeup and um, change into our wardrobe and and they make us look exactly like the kid the kid that we're doubling wow mm-hmm. yeah so it's and that usually takes anywhere from uh, 45 minutes to an hour and a half in the mornings it, it depends on it depends on the costume it depends on the hair and the make makeup everything takes a lot of time and so this is not a short day obviously it's not a short day this is why <laughs> things take t- 12 to 16 hour days now when it's, you're done is it you know we talked a lot about safety and protection and everything like that but i i'm sure you still got to feel bruises and falls and stuff to some extent oh yeah i mean you get you get bruised bruised up and sore and all that i've I fortunately haven't been hurt, so I'm grateful for that. Knock on wood. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's right. <laughs> yeah, um, well, but it, it can be it can be taxing sometimes, but it's it's worth it. It's a lot of fun. And it sounds like it, it sounds like you've worked with some great crews too. Mm-hmm. I'm sure that makes a difference on a set. Absolutely. Um, when especially when you're working on a movie or a TV show, a TV show. Uh, can, it takes a lot longer to shoot. A, a movie will go like maybe three, four months. Um, a TV sh- show can be anywhere from five to eight months. Um, but you become like a tight knit family. You spend so much time with these people on set every single day, and um, you, be, you basically you're like living with these, almost like living with these people every day. In a way, you get to know <laughs> people very well and. Um, yeah, and no, and every family, uh, like you know, every family has its their good moments and bad moments. Not everybody gets along a hundred percent, but most of the time, I've I've had some really good teams where we get along wonderfully. Well, that's huge, and yeah. most people probably know. Yeah, you know, if the team comes together, ultimately everybody has the same goal to make an amazing project, whatever it is, whether it's a TV show or a movie. Exactly that they all have a vested interest. Absolutely. And um, it's, it's really exciting when you work on a, a big project that everybody is so excited for, that they've been fans of their whole lives. And every everybody's like a kid in the candy store. They're like, oh my gosh, that was so cool. And <laughs> <laughs> that stunt gag was amazing. <laughs> and everybody just is happy to be there. And um, I've had some very special s- sets like that where the energy is just very infectious and exciting and um so what's one of those for you can uh can the man share? the mandalorian i i when i worked on the mandalorian for a week uh it was the first season episode two uh the child uh i played a jawa like a little jawa character in that and um everybody was just so ec- excited to be there i mean it's star wars right you know absolutely so, and the people have like grown up with Star Wars and 
uh, remember going to theaters and seeing it like 50 times. People are diehard fans and uh, it, it was really neat to, to see the set um, because the set pieces make it feel like it's real. Like the environment, the the set deck that that create the um, uh, like Tatooine and all the all these places that they filmed at in, in Star Wars, uh, it looked so realistic. The attention to the detail is amazing. You step on the set and you feel like you're in Star Wars. Wow! You feel like you're on Tatooine. It it was amazing. It was indescribable. And then I'm sure, and you put on the the Jawa costume. Yeah. And- yeah, and you you just become a little Jawa. I'm a Jawa. <laughs> I'm just like, give me that egg. <laughs> yum, 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 yum. <laughs> it helps you become that character. It really does. I'm sure it does. So you talked a little, you know, you talked a little bit about obviously your, you know, one thing they saw in your was your ability to because of your size to do this stunt work for kids. Mm-hmm. You know, that has to, you know, I mean, that had to just be, you know, thrilling in itself because, you know, you took what some people may think is a disadvantage. You know, everybody's like, oh, height, you know. And I remember I walk in, I, everybody, I'd be walking to school and someone go, yeah, you're only five foot. And I go, no, I'm five two, (laughs) you know, something like that. But you took, you know, what some people might look at as a disadvantage height wise and you turned it into like, a blessing in your life absolutely um i i definitely i i I definitely feel it was a blessing from god because um growing up it was difficult being little and uh kids are little jerks (laughs) you know they're just (laughs) brutally honest brutally honest and and they can be rude and mean and um I, I had a tough time with being with being little, uh, you know, in my early childhood. I hated it for a, for a while, and then the older I got, the more I accepted and like learned to love myself and accept my size. And um, it, the coolest part was I always dreamed of working in the movies from a young age. It and uh, I I didn't know how to make that happen, but it. In, in the state of Ohio, like I, I didn't think when I was younger, I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to get to Hollywood or how this is going to happen or, you know, how to make a career out of this. But it's like everything kind of fell into place and I trusted God and um, it may be the universe for some people. And I just knew I knew I had to follow that path. I didn't and I didn't give up on it give up on it it was something that I really wanted and so whenever an opportunity presented itself uh I I ran with it like I'm I'm very perceptive to things that enter into my life and I think a big part of it is being open um and aware of the blessings that you were given and, and just recognizing those signs and receiving them and, and knowing that you deserve that and just just going for it. You know, don't don't wait to make a choice. Don't don't take your time. If, if something falls into your path, you, you need to you need to take that opportunity that you're given and run with it. It's there for a reason. <laughs> you said that. That's that's beautiful. I mean, there there are so many things like within what you just said. Mm-hmm. You know that you you know that you believed in yourself, that you held to a vision, that you know that you trusted your intuition, and you knew that God's plan or the universe's plan. You know, you you trusted in that, and you had faith, and. And also, in you, when that opportunity presented itself, you know, it sounds like you I, know, I didn't you, question you it. You didn't question it. You know what it was. Yeah. And it doesn't sound like you spent a lot of time on on the how how this was all going to unfold from the time that you came out of high school to the time you ended up in L.A. Right. It sounded like you held more to the vision of 
this is what I'm going to be doing. Mm-hmm. I held on to it and I, I, I didn't give up. I kept, I kept going, you know, even though that, I, even though I couldn't see the whole path, everything from when I first started back in, this was like 10 years ago, I first started to pursue a career in this, maybe, maybe a little longer. And, um, it's every, every little yes that you, every little let, yes, sorry, I'm trying to figure <laughs> out how to say this. Every little yes leads to another yes, another open door. And it, and it just, it all adds up. All these yeses lead you to your des- destination. Like, yes, I'll do, th- I'll do this little job. Uh, yes, I'll network with these people. Yes, uh, you know what, I will go to that thing and just see what happens and not have expectations, but just have fun and uh, be open to the doors that might come from that. Oh. Being open is the key. Yeah, having fun, being open, mm-hmm. and and not setting the expectation like, well, if I go here, I expect this. Right. Because that leaves the door open for opportunities. Absolutely. Is there other things that you feel like you want to get across? I do want to get across um, that going for your dreams takes a lot of persistence. And it's it's very attainable to get to have your dreams come true but you have to you have to be open to that the time frame that it happens um you know what my favorite little uh image is there's this there's this image of um a miner that is digging for diamonds i i don't know if you've seen this but it's like a little comic piece this miner is digging for diamonds and um, he has his like little tool or hammer, and he's he's almost there. He's like an inch away from getting to those diamonds, but but he like there's there's an image of him so showing him how close he is, but he can't see it. And then there's an image of him t- an image of him turning his back and walking the other way because because he was tired, because he didn't want to do it anymore, or because. He didn't think it was possible. He gave up too soon and didn't get to those diamonds when if he just stuck at it a little longer, he would have had it. So I, for what I want to get across is that persistence is key. Just don't ever, don't ever give up. We like to have these set expectations that we have to get things, we have to have things in a certain time frame, but, but no. God knows the best time for us. He knows our heart's desires. And if, if it's in, a, in, in alignment with his will and your path, like he will make it happen. Or, and your dreams will come true. You just got to keep going. That's a good analogy. Mm-hmm. You know, showing that, that because you're right, there are a lot of people that just, you they, they, work, yeah, they work at it, work at it, work at it, and they're like, that's not going to happen, mm-hmm. you know. And I think a lot of it too is maybe it's not happening the exact way that they thought it would. And that's and that goes back to getting too married to the outcome that it has to happen a certain way. Absolutely, yes. That that's you. You said it perfectly. People get attached to having things uh, done a certain way, and that can actually. Um, that can actually harm you more than help you in in getting you where getting you where you want to be. Yeah, I think it I think with that it closes the door to opportunities or you don't recognize certain opportunities because you don't think they're aligned with the direction that you have in your mind. Uh, yep, I agree. I agree 100%. What kind of like big obstacles or, you know, barriers came up in your way that where you were just almost Mm-hmm. Where it really took everything you had to just continue to move forward. Yeah. So uh, one of the biggest obstacles I had was probably um, um, when I was acting here in Ohio. Like uh, I got very discouraged when all the agencies in the state of Ohio rejected me and didn't take me on as a um, uh 
as a um, client uh, because I, I didn't fit the demographic of, of the area. Um, there, there's mostly small commercials, small parts, you know, um, uh, it's, it's, it's a small f film production community here. Um, and I understand why it wasn't anything personal. It, it's, it's business. Um, but that rejection and that frustration that I had from not getting a lot of acting jobs or work here really, um, it really, I, it, it was really hard for me and I, al I almost gave up and, and then, uh, there, there was a time I was really, uh, discouraged and almost gave up and, but then I kept going. I, I, I found the opportunity to train with stunt work. That's when this, the door to stunt work opened up for me. Um, and I was able to uh, lear learn how to double kids and, and then move out to LA. Also, also moving out to LA was probably the biggest obstacle or my, myself. I, I didn't want to move and leave my family. And so making that leap was probably the most difficult choice I've ever made because I, uh, I just didn't know what was on the other side. And, uh, I am very much a homebody and I love my family. I could have, I could have been like living here until I was, you know, <laughs> old you know <laughs> like I would have been I would have been com totally comfortable living in Ohio for the rest of my life and and uh overcoming that obstacle of le of leaving my comfort zone was probably the biggest um biggest thing I've had to overcome I I had to leave my comfort zone and I think that's I think that's how it is for mm -hmm for a lot of people that are reaching for their dreams if usually they're not going to find their dreams or you know follow through with them sitting in their comfort zone exactly it's usually once they step out that the opportunities and the doors start opening up and unfolding yep yep that's it and i i i just hope that you know my success is an example of that because it's it's possible if if i did it like i i i used to play it safe all the time like and i'm very much like i like to be comfortable and um and i was able to take that leap of faith you know, uh, and give it a give it a try and it obviously worked out beautifully and it worked out it worked out very well for me and now i've i have a very successful career in the film industry, stunt doubling kids. And I love it. I love my jobs. I get to do something different and fun every single day. And I, I get to work with creative people, people that make me laugh. Uh, I get to see a, a film production from start to finish and see how the movie magic happens. And I'm, I'm so grateful to have my, have my career. I think that's a key too that, you know, you know, mentioning gratitude, mm -hmm. you know, you seem very grateful and very thankful for, you know, all the opportunities that have come your way. Yes. I, I have to, I have to be thankful and appreciation brings in more things to be grateful for in your life. It absolutely does. No, there's no doubt about it. I mean, that's, that's how more opportunities come in and, you know, and you're doing what you love. Absolutely. Uh, doesn't Wayne Dyer say, follow your bliss? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, one, yeah. Yeah, this guy, I was yeah. going to say, one of, one of his sayings is uh, something like that that's out of one of those. Yeah. You know what I, what I quote wise, what I did think about when you were talking about, you don't have to see the whole thing, you know, you just take that leap of faith. You know, one of the things that, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. said was, you know, you don't have to see the whole staircase, just take the first step, you yes. know? And, and that's basically what it is. You know, it's a lot of people don't, don't leave their comfort zone. They don't take that first step. It's so important. It's so important. And, uh, you have to, yeah, you have to try. 
You have to take that first step. And to, okay, use your, <laughs> to use your Star Wars analogy, yeah. well, you could use Yoda's advice. <laughs> what does he say? He says, do. <laughs> do exactly. Do. There is no try. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know, I have a laptop here. Can we take a look at your stunt reel that you did? Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to show you the stunt reel. Okay. I'll pull it open. Here. My finger on it. <laughs> like... Okay. There we go. Right. Yeah. Oh, there we go. There, I'll make it full screen. So I was one of those in the back, and that was me. I just got vaporized by the Mandalorian. I'm this one up here too. So all of these are little clips of me doing different stunts for kids. I got thrown into the stairs. And I drove a forklift, which that was pretty cool. Nice. I never thought I would do that. What about here? Oh, this is when, um, this was on Grey's Anatomy, where I j had to jump through fire with a stunt woman. Inside the yeah. blanket there? Inside the blanket, yeah. And this was a 50-foot cliff that I was dangling off of in Hawaii, and um, I had to jump over to this guy. This, this was a fun stunt. And how high are you off the ground in that one? Of uh, the, the one before that? Yeah. About uh, 15 feet. That was it. Most of, um, most of the falls that I do are uh, 20 feet or less. I haven't done a very big high fall, but yeah, 20 feet's decent. Absolutely is. I take it heights don't bother you. No, heights don't bother me. So when you pointed out in that first part in The Mandalorian, you getting vaporized. <laughs> so is, the, is that the effect that's brought in later on? Do you read that part in the script and then the effect of the, the gun that went off to vaporize you, mm -hmm. that's not even happening? Right, so when we filmed that, um, the Mandalorian wasn't even, he wasn't even shooting at me. I was just walking down the ramp with that piece of sheet metal. Um, and they asked me to throw the sheet metal and then drop to the ground fast out, out of the frame of camera. And they, if there was any like piece of my body left in frame, they were gonna digitally edit me out and post. So in post-production and then they were going to um, digitally add the wardrobe, like clothes or like like that little robe I was wearing, they were gonna digitally add that to make it go explode and like little pieces of clothes go flying. Wow. So that little effect, which is, you can see it, I think it was right there. Right there, you can see the robe going to fly. I see it with little sparks. That was all um, added in, in post-production, the digital effects. Now in the script, does it say what's gonna happen so that you know like how to act, well, how to? Yeah, so, there's, so the script gives you a general idea. Um, it's the stunt coordinator's job to offer different things, like uh, different ideas for the director to work with. Um, that specific, um, moment wasn't exactly in the script. They they wanted to see Jawas getting vaporized. Like, ooh, ooh, we want one to be vaporized over here. But they were actually coming up, coming up with that on the fly. Like, oh, let's let's have this Jawa over here do this and be vaporized, and let's have you come down the ramp and be vaporized. So it was more of a general idea, and then 
uh, the specific details were figured out on the fly. Okay. In one of those, it looked like in the beginning scene where you were on the docks mm -hmm. and the, before the bomb went off, you know, did you actually go off into the water? Oh, so I, I did actually jump off the Santa Monica Pier with the stunt woman, but we were in a harness and on a wire and we came to a hard stop after we jumped like a foot above the water. So you didn't hit the water. So we didn't go in the water, no. And the reason for that being, what, once you get wet, you can't reshoot the scene. Um, you would need a whole new wig and a whole new wardrobe, and you you could only do that one time. Whereas, um, if they kept us above the water, we could shoot that as many times as we needed to get that scene right. So we jumped maybe like four times, four or five times for that one shot. And when you say going off the Santa Monica Pier, how high up is that? Oh, that was a 20 feet. Okay. Yeah. A, a 20 foot fall. Yeah. Well, camera angles can make it a world of difference. Absolutely. No, and that makes sense. Is there any of those other ones that you, you know, want to point something out? I mean, to some people, something might look simple like being thrown into the stairs. Oh, But yeah. I'm sure... A lot of work goes into that. Yeah. Just that one little scene. So that one little scene where I was thrown into the stairs. Um, where was that? It's over here somewhere. Let's go back to that. So right there where I was thrown in the, into the stairs, we rehearsed that um, a couple times. And um, I had to fall in a way that in a specific spot so that the, the actress, the, the young actress they had um, could, could match or, or be in a safe position where she was comfortable on the stairs, where she could lay on them and, and still stay in frame and in the shot. Um, if, I went, if I went straight into those stairs, she, she could have bumped or hit her head and, or her nose or her face. So I turned my body to the side and used my arms for protection um, for not only for my safety but for the actor and they had mats for the actress when she was uh, when she was doing this and all, all she had to do was go like this she didn't have to get thrown hard she just had to make su like a subtle movement okay um, safely so I we always try to um, we try to make the our positioning convenient for the actor as well. Because she's being swapped in and out with you. Exactly. She's being swapped in and out with me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And they, and they needed to... So my face is hidden from camera here, but they needed an angle where she could turn her head and face camera. So she would be... The camera would be over here in this corner of the room looking up at her face. Okay. As... As she was hitting the stairs, that would create that right. That would create the full look that it yeah. looks real. Right. Is there other things that you want to point out, like a different? I know we went through it pretty quickly. Like what was the like the Grey's Anatomy fire scene? Oh, that looks like the fire engulfed both of you. Yeah. So that was the fire scene right here. Um, they had a flame bar at the at the base of this hallway and and the flames went up like maybe five feet um some of this like around the edges here is dig digitally enhanced um but we did jump th over some flames some some real flames and i'm sure you could still feel the heat you can still feel feel the heat and it wasn't that wide um like the the flame bars i think it was maybe just like uh, a couple inches of fire. It wasn't like a, okay. a like a lot miles of fire that we were running through. It was we jumped over a, a bar, like a flame bar. So it wasn't too bad. We, we felt the heat for like a couple seconds, and that blanket uh, was fireproofed. Uh, our clothing was fireproofed, so our clothes wouldn't catch fire, and um, the blanket was damp so that um, to protect us from the heat. Still has to be pretty thrilling. I mean, you read thrilling. the script. You're 
being picked up in someone's arms and you're yeah. going through a wall of fire. <laughs> Jumping through fire. <laughs> Is there any other specifics on some of the other clips that you want to talk about? Um, let me see. Let's go back over here. Oh, I think my favorite stunt was at the end. The end here when I uh, did the rope swing into the lake. And um, that was another 20 foot fall. And, and that, that was a lot of fun. Um, on that stunt, it was a pilot called C Council of Dads. And um, they originally wanted the kid on the dad's shoulders um, on the rope swing. So the dad's swinging with the kid on the, with him on top of their shoulders. But um, that wasn't, uh, that wasn't possible to do because we would have like flipped over. Um, so we had to come up with a different uh, different ideas of how to swing together on the rope, which was kind of fun. We got creative and put our heads together and we're like, oh, what's the best way to um, hold, like uh, D Dave, who I did that stunt with, was like, uh, what's the best way to hold you with where I can have one hand on the rope, but also um, be carrying you so that we can swing together without doing a flop into the water or flipping over. And so um, I was like, well, ge generally, um, you know, I, I know because I double a lot of kids, like being on, like being on his hip, uh, on his side, uh, would have been the safest way to, to go on the rope swing together. Well, um, yeah, and usually you see parents carrying their kids on their hip all the time. You see moms putting kids on their hip. It's your center, right. that makes your center of gravity um, equal. Because it looked like when you went down, I mean, obviously if it wasn't planned out, you mm -hmm. could be just landing on top of the other person. Yeah, he could have landed on me or I could have landed on top of him. Correct. And um, so having, so being on the, on the side of him, uh, as you can see right here, let me go back there real quick. Okay, so I was kind of, I was kind of on, almost on, on his hip. Yeah, I can see that from there. Yeah. So it, it was kind of fun to be creative and just figure out different ways to do this. And Now, was that a one take? Because obviously you both got wet. Yeah, that was, yeah. One, that was a one take. <laughs> yeah. It, that was a one and done. One and done. Yep. Sometimes things don't uh, go exactly the way you have planned. You can plan all you want, um, but sometimes they don't work out right and you just need to come up with creative solutions. The whole industry is about coming up with creative solutions to film things. And um, Does the coordinator work like the go-between the director? Yes. The stunt coordinator is the... Um, is is basically the the action designer and he yeah he's the go between between uh to the director he goes he goes to the director with um all the action scenes so we talked about safety <laughs> and then this just came to mind yeah so do they do directors ever come up with stuff that you just look at or the stunt coordinator looks at and goes there's there's no way you know or do you, or does the stunt coordinator offer workarounds at that point? Um, there, there are some things that directors do ask that are not possible in the way that they ask for it. Uh, the stunt coordinator's job is to figure out how to give the director what they want, but but in the safest and best way possible and that might not always be exactly how the director describes he's like oh i want i want this uh i want this car to be blown up on the street and i want it to uh land over there on the right hand side well there could be some safety issue that it, they can't have it blow up on that right hand side for whatever reason so the stunt coordinator's job is to be like, hey, we can't do it that way. That's, that's not possible, but I can do it this way. And you can still have 
you're, that you're seeing where a car blows up, it's just going to look a little differently than you than you had planned. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. And and the directors are usually flexible with that because they don't want um, they don't want anybody to get hurt or um, they want things to be done safely and efficiently. They don't want to slow production down. So the coordinator's job is to be completely honest with the director and be like, hey, we can't do it this way, but here are some solutions. It sounds like the coordinators have years of experience for the most part. Yeah, they have years and years of, of, of experience. A lot of those stunt coordinators that I work for have been in the industry for over 35 years, maybe 40. They've been in it for a long time. Wow. Yeah. And in their mind, they can probably reference any stunt that, yeah, we've done that and this is the, the result, <laughs> the outcome. Yeah. They, they can reference anything and they, they, they tell, the stunt coordinators have the coolest stories. They tell you all the crazy stunts that they've done and um, <laughs> uh, some, some uh, they, have, they have just crazy stories. <laughs> well, I'm sure you have a few of your own I over do. the years to pass down to your family. <laughs> Absolutely. It makes life more fun. You know, one of the things I was thinking is we talked about where you've come over the last almost decade, basically. You know, where do you see yourself 10 years from now? Where's where's Molly's dreams taking her? I would still love to be working in the film industry, um, but I would like to um, I would I would like to get like a starring action role like just be this little badass <laughs> 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 like like some superhero or um, maybe the like an undercover cop that goes after the bad guys you know that you, you don't I'm like the I, I would be like the lead and I uh, people won't expect this little badass to come after them and I'll, I'll just like <laughs> I'll take everyone out. No, <laughs> you know, I, I want to I want to play like a, a good a character that fights for good in the world. But um, and where I, I love movies where uh, good overcomes evil. And yeah, I would just that that would be a fun role to do is to to be a superhero or um, some CIA agent or I don't know. Some, something like that. Do you see yourself writing that script? I I could, yeah. I I would love to write that script. <laughs> I mean, look at look at Sylvester, Sylvester Stallone wrote the Rocky script and yeah. you know and starred in it. So That's, anything's possible. Anything's possible. You're right. You're right. I could write myself a role and then pitch it to like producers and and you never know. You never know. I. I'm going to get on that. <laughs> I'm so happy that I could come talk with you and, and talk about dreams and, um, uh, and, and how to get, how to achieve our dreams and how to be open to opportunities. And I, I'm so happy that I can share my story and then hopefully inspire other people to, to, you know, go after their dreams too. No, absolutely. I mean, that's what, that's what the You Can, You Will Foundation is all about. It's helping people empower themselves. And it's not it's not telling them how to do it, but it's sharing tools and information to help them discover the way within. And, you know, just like you said throughout most of this talk, um, you know, the, the tools that you used and pulled on in times of difficulty, you know, all those came from inside you. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what we want people to help discover. You know, there's, we did a workshop, you know, a couple months ago back at UPS and one of the, one of the leaders, Lisa, told everyone to get out a pen and paper and, you know, and she was going to give you the steps to success. I and then she that. says, ha, huh, I'm just kidding. She said, everybody's path is different. That's so and, and what true. It, and what it did is it brought people to the present moment. They thought they were getting ready to write these successful steps down. And, you know, everybody's path doesn't look like a ladder. She mentioned it could look like a jungle gym and you go sideways and then you back down and you go back up. And, 
you know, to end up where you're going. And I think that ties into what you were saying about, you know, not knowing how you were going to get there, mm-hmm. just that you were going to get there. That's so, that's so amazing. And that's, it's so true. There, there's not one method to success. And in the industry, I can't tell you how many um, stunt people and actors I have met that found success in the industry the same way. Every, everybody's story is completely different. I there's there was an actor that uh, that uh, I don't remember his name, but um, an actor was like a working actor was pulled off the street um, from a coffee shop because they were short on people and they needed. Uh, someone to say a line in the movie because everybody else was busy so they're just like oh hey you in the coffee shop there can you can you come over here and just say a quick line or something like that and then he became a working actor that way and then there's other people that have been you know uh do they did the similar path that i did they started off doing extra and stand and work and you know work their way up um that way and then there's uh some of the stump people i've met uh came from the circus they're Cirque du Soleil performers and uh they were scouted by a stunt coordinator looking for a specific skill set that they couldn't find um just from you know uh, from the normal public you know they they needed like an expert aerialist or an, an expert synchronized swimmer and um these these stunt performers didn't even have the dream of working in the movies and they just kind of got sucked into the film industry that way they're like oh (laughs) you know (laughs) right this is the direction my path's gonna go right now (laughs) right and yeah and um it's so fascinating I, i that's probably one of my other favorite things about working in the film industry is just hearing everybody's stories and how everybody got to where they're at no, because everybody's got a different story. Everybody and has a different one. And I think a lot of times people don't take the time to listen to people's stories. And there's there's just there's something of value in it to listening to someone's story. There is. There's always value. And you can take away uh you can take away so much from everybody, like every person that you meet in the, in this world. And it doesn't have to be anybody in the film industry. Like the person you're n- shopping with at the grocery store or like someone standing in line you never know how somebody's going to affect you or what impact they're going to have it it doesn't have to be some huge um, chance meeting you know Um, everyday people uh, impact other people and and help help each other you got to look you got to look for the angels that are placed in your path at the at the right time they're always there They're people always just there. people just don't always see them mm-hmm. those are just great i mean that that's just great insight thank you no you're welcome because 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 you're right you're no different than anybody else the difference is you were persistent and followed your dreams you know those signs and those angels and the guidance is is there for everyone absolutely most of the time people are so distracted they just don't they're not aware of it. Right. They walk right by it when when it's right there in front of them. Yep. And sometimes you need a little slap in the face. Just be like... <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Just be like, hey, there's your angel. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Turn your head. Don't you see that? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> well, I wouldn't expect anything less from a stunt woman than <laughs> a slap in the face. <laughs> You know it. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me, Andy. No, you're welcome, Molly. You know, you've always... One thing that's always struck me from the beginning is, you know, you've always had this bright, positive outlook on life. And I think, you know, you mentioned having fun, and it's just ever since I've known you, it's this, you know, like, it could be a gray day outside, but in in Molly's world, it's, you know... a a bright sunny day and and that makes a huge difference too in people's lives and and people are affected by that thank you you're welcome thank you so much for watching us on inspired path 
if you've got an inspiring story or know somebody that's inspiring, hit us up in the comments below. And of course, give us a thumbs up if you like what you heard, subscribe to our channel, and hit that notification bell. Thank you.